A warm welcome from the Women Business Collaborative, WBC, with our 60 partner organizations and our hundreds of leaders. We're just grateful every day. We push data, we push profiles, and we push action leadership. Everybody talks about thought leadership. We push action leadership against our nine action items. And very quickly, I think you saw two weeks ago, we put out our Women CEOs in America report and did the report guard of change and data. Every month with Equilar, we put out a report on women joining public boards. I think you all saw that we're making history. 46% of all board appointments in the month of September were women and a third of those women of color. And we push the envelope. Today, WBC is thrilled in this CEO roundtable to have leaders of legacy who are unstoppable as they are pushing companies of purpose and leaders of purpose. You're gonna hear from four humble leaders that truly are energizing so many. So whether it's reimagining capitalism as a critical, critical subject for leaders, we're seeing so many stand up and we call for everyone. The Business Roundtable back in 2019 put out their first statement on companies of purpose. And today, led by Mary Barra, CEO of General Motors, who we honored, who said she wants to be the most inclusive, innovative company in the world. We thank the Business Roundtable and Mary Barra. Barra. And we look to Indra Nui, who absolutely started the one first company at PepsiCo of purpose. And when Indra said, it's purpose before profits, because you make more profit when you end up with purpose. And we were honored to honor Indra as we were with Sandra Brown Duckett, one of the two black CEOs who talked about purpose and acceleration of action. And we honored Joey Ryman, who wrote the book on purpose and is teaching at Emory has been for decades on companies of purpose. And our own Robert Reese, who will be co-moderating today, but I think you know that he reaches out to nearly 9,000 CEOs. He pushes leaders of purpose. We are also supporting at WBC and part of this new film on companies of purpose called Why is Mona Lisa Smiling? It will be out in the spring to all business schools and others. And I think you know that the CEOs of Walmart and Procter and Gamble and Salesforce and MasterCard and others are all part. So Fortune runs nearly a daily update on companies of purpose, Forbes has named a chief purpose officer. The Wall Street Journal is pushing chief purpose officers. Deloitte with its chief purpose officer and CEO puts out and says it's time to walk the walk and not the talk and be impactful on the issues of purpose and accountability and communicate it with your brand and your communities and with your talent. And today, purpose with talent is essential because recruiting and retention are being disrupted as not only young people, but so many are looking for companies of purpose. So purpose is the edict now for legacy and for purposeful for companies and great companies. How important today that we have three board members running this round table with four great CEOs. Those are Robert Reese of the CEO Forum and is Jose Zalestra 
of not only gender fair, but on the CEO form of Companies of Purpose. And Becky Shambau, who will be co-moderating of, of Shambau Leadership, pushing leadership and companies of purpose. So with that, we're really looking forward to learning, to accelerating and ensuring as WBC has now set up a committee of companies of purpose to join our advisory council and WBC. And with that, a joy to turn it over to Robert Reese and Becky Shambau. Well, thank you so much, Edie. And um, what a leader to follow is Edie, the best ever. And so why, why this is such a great conversation is two things, legacy purpose, legacy why? Because legacy, all of these four are no longer in the CEO spot. So that means now they're the chair or they can talk freely about everything and they can talk about past, present, and then about future. And hopefully we'll get them together to ask them actions for the future. But when we think about purpose, really, here's what it means to me. We are right now in the fourth phase. The first phase was when Alfred Sloan in the 1920s created the corporation with General Motors. The second was in 1950s, when Peter Drucker created the concept of management. The third was in the 1980s when the Japanese brought in quality and team. And now we are in the fourth and we're, like Edie says, we're fully moving forward. And that is an integration of purpose and profit. Purpose is becoming at the front of everything. So we, we have great leaders in, in telecommunications, Ralph Dale Vega from vice chairman of AT&T and, um, and Judy, Judy is, is the one with diversified search, recreated the entire search industry where it was always just one person, but she said, I'm not putting my name there. And she has grown it to be like among the top five in the world with a unique model where she is driving in her company more diversified search than anywhere in the world. And that is really the whole future, think about it, of our future CEOs. So that is fantastic. Doug Conant and, and Doug, um, he was the CEO of, of, um, of, of the Campbell Soup Company. He also you know, was a president at Nabisco, but he turned that around, but he is always such a purpose-driven person. And, and, then, and then Walt also in real estate, when we're talking about Prologis and what you're doing now, like with your new book and all of your purpose that you're driving. So great to have everyone. Want to start off with Ralph. So Ralph, uh, there's a lot of things we could talk about, but you told me a story about what, uh, I, I believe it was a woman in Ecuador who taught you a new philosophy of why diversity is that central to everything we do. I, I think it's just an incredible story. So uh, yes, uh, early in my career, and I was so lucky this happened early on, uh, I was responsible for operations, wireless operations in 11 countries in Latin America. When I looked at one particular country, I realized that they were running a good shop, they were doing well, but they, I felt there was something missing. When I went in and looked, they had a very senior team, no women on it and uh, not very young people in it. And I thought we were missing the young market, the youth market. So we did something incredible that changed my whole management philosophy is we established a, a segment called the youth segment in Ecuador, they called it the cool segment. And it was for customers 25 years of age or younger. We made the critical decision to put a person from the segment to lead the segment. So I placed a 22-year-old young lady to lead the youth segment with PNL responsibilities. And it was like earth shattering. She changed everything. She changed the distribution of the product, the colors of the product, hired an all-girls band to promote it, and finally made this presentation to me to approve the advertising plan. And when I saw the advertising plan, I had to be honest with her and tell her, look, I really don't like it. I think it's too aggressive. It's not in concert with the brand and the room went silent. And what she said to me, 
was, sir, you're not the target audience. <laughs> and I, it was just like a thunderbolt hit me between the eyes. I said, you know what? I put you on this job to make a difference. I'm going to fund all of your ideas. Go forth and do it. And what happened after that, sales skyrocketed. The text messaging per capita in Ecuador went from bottom in, in the world to number two in the world next to the Philippines. And it was a great lesson to learn that I almost stopped this young lady because she had a different set of things that I was perhaps biased about. When I let her do her thing and support her, it changed my whole philosophy about leading people. So when I came back to the States, I put a person uh, from the Hispanic market to lead a Hispanic market, the same thing for the African-American and Asian markets. And in a period of three years, we went to number one market share for wireless postpaid service in the US in the Hispanic market, the African-American market and the Asian market. It's all because of the power of the diverse thoughts that this young lady taught me early on in my career in Ecuador. That's, that is great. I'm gonna hand off now to my partner in crime, Becky. Hello everybody, Ralph, thank you so much for, for joining us and carving out this time. Uh, certainly an inspirational story. I love storytelling. But let me just build upon that. You know, you were recently interviewed in uh, Latino magazine and you were quoted as one of the most important critical attributes for all leaders is the ideation, creativity um, and innovation for organizations, which we know. But the, 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 I think the question is, how do we really harness that? And you know, in your story reveal that diversity with inclusion really drives that engagement, innovation. But what advice do you have then okay, to put this really into action? How do we take the diversity and build inclusion to really drive that? Do you have any other examples within previous experiences or seeing organizations that are really doing that? I think that's a key priority now for every organization and everyone on the phone today. Yeah, I, I, look, I think uh, having innovative thinking in the organization is critical. In fact, the corporate board uh, had a recent survey where the, the top issue that CEOs are looking for today, given the pandemic and the post-pandemic environment, the number one thing they look for is innovative thinking because we're having to innovate on everything that we have known. And so it is a critical aspect of it. You always have to, in my view, ask the question, what if we could do something different? What difference would that make? I experienced that early in my career when we were in the wireless industry and we said, what if we could put music inside a phone? We, we actually tried it. We, we had the first phone in the world that had iTunes music in it. It was a failure. But that failure led us to work with Steve Jobs to launch a new phone with music on it called the iPhone and the rest is history. It was an amazing innovation all by asking what if we could really revolutionize the way that we were running our business and the product we were serving to our customers. I think that's great. And you know, when you shared that story and that perfect example, I think of be relentlessly curious, right? Um, like the ex example you have with the 22 year old new employee, I mean, you were curious, okay, let's explore this further, right? So I think that's just a really important practice and uh, has benefited you and many yeah. organizations. Thank you for that. Yeah, Be Robert, Becky, I, want, I wanted to add one last point to this because this is a really point of significance. If you looked mm -hmm. at the market before Apple launched the iPhone, there were three top phone makers in the world were Nokia, Blackberry, and Motorola. Today, they no longer make phones. And they no yeah. longer make phones in some cases because they fail to recognize that people would be willing to use the phone even if it didn't have a physical keyboard. BlackBerry in particular had their assumptions and their whole company bet on the fact that people would not want to do that. They were wrong. And so the message to leaders is you have to make sure that you unlearn what you learn that is no longer true. In this case, it was no longer true that people would only want to use a phone if it had a keyboard on it. Mm -hmm. And that's that really getting out there and testing the market and a broad range of people that are going to be your consumers versus just people who think and look like me, right? So exactly. Great. Thank you for amplifying that.
uh, Ralph. Robert, I'm going to turn it over to you. We have one more question for Ralph today. Actually, let's move it. Let's move to um, to Superstar Judy right there. So you go ahead, kick it off. Oh, okay, great. Judy, thank you again. I, I just admire your background. And, and by the way, thank you for being a founding sponsor for WBC. I just wanted to, to call that out. So thank you so much. Um, you, you know, in talking with you, what I've, what I've learned was it's very exciting that you've launched and created a fund that will help women entrepreneurs, right? Um, tell us more about that um, and what you hope to accomplish from this fund. I think you're on mute. Hey, Judy, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Oh, gotcha. Perfect. Okay, great. Okay. Well, thank, okay. you. thank you so much. And it's a real honor to be here today, and especially a part of an organization that my dear friend, Edie Frazier, heads up. Talk about a woman leader. They don't get any better than Edie. So she's who we should be celebrating. But I love the theme of this conference. Call it, it's around purpose. Because, you know, that's really... My whole life has been that when I graduated from college, I went to Washington and I worked for Walter Mondale for 10 years as his personal secretary, the youngest in the United States Senate. And this is back in the 60s. So don't be adding up my age, please. But in any event, it was those years where it was the Vietnam War, where it was civil rights. I went to the Martin Luther King. I have a dream speech. I mean, every day, you know, there were huge purposes, you know, that were very much a part of of our whole existence. And that kind of, you know, stayed with me when we started Diversified Search. The whole purpose there, you know, back then women were secretaries, nurses, or teachers. And our purpose was, you know, let's, there's got to, women, you know, need the opportunity to, uh, you know, be able to have professional jobs. And what can we do to make that happen? And over the years together, you know, we've had a wonderful group that's built Diversified Search Group into the largest, you know, woman founded on. Um, you know, firm in the world that really is focused on that. And so, you know, that's always been our purpose. And so we're obviously thrilled to see this, the great, you know, statistics that we're seeing today in terms of the data changing. So um, we have, I have started this fund um, and we just had our uh, second meeting the other day and we're going to officially launch it in a couple of weeks. And you know, it's my, I feel like I've been so blessed. You know, everybody used to always say, you really can't have it all. Well, guess what? You know, you really can have it all. And I feel like I've been fortunate to have it all by being a woman entrepreneur. So the purpose of this fund is to make that opportunity possible for other people. And so uh, I'm putting personal money in it just to, just to see how this goes, because I don't want anybody telling me what to do or how I have to give the money or any of that. It's all grants. It's not loans. It's not taking equity positions. It's really to give grants to women entrepreneurs that have been in business for a couple of years and they're at that critical stage where they need more money to take the next step, because I remember that that was always the hardest, these different steps that you get to. And the other thing that I think is unique about this is we've got, you know, the largest law firm here in Philadelphia, run by a woman, have, they're going to do pro bono legal services to help the companies, you know, that we give grants to. We have a, our accounting firm is going to do the same thing, an IT firm um, and marketing, pub, you know, pub, publicity. So we're, you know, we're looking to, you know, really help these uh, women entrepreneurs that we fund continue to grow and be successful but you know and it, you know it's just like and i'm sure we'll talk more about this but you know it's really there's so many bright smart wonderful successful women out there but you know it takes a little something extra sometimes to, to get to that next level and it's getting them to speak up and i I'll, we can talk about that more later but that's that's also a big part of what we're trying to help them do that, I mean, talk about purposeful action, right? I mean, I think there's just an inflection point with women businesses that they only get to a certain place and then they need that other advisory support and funding. So I, I am confident that you're going to really have a huge impact for women entrepreneurs. So we thank you for that. Robert. So, so Judy, you know, it, it's really, it's more important than 
not that, that everyone realizes what search does. Search is truly the harbinger of the next generation of leadership. You are finding the people who are going to be the leaders in the future. And, and you have been really a true pioneer uh, through all these decades of, of leading the movement. Now the movement is really taking hold. So here's, here's the real question. What have you learned in your career in building, you know, frankly, one of the largest organizations in America and 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 one of the most influential, but how do you sustain and how do you elevate the growth of this movement? What have you learned that we could all learn from that? Well, Robert, you're so gracious. Are you available to come work as our PR, uh, <laughs> uh, Eve? <laughs> um, you know, I think that, that the most important thing I've learned, I came from the South where there was a different perception back in the 50s and 60s of what women should be doing. And so um, I feel like that, it, you know, you've got you've to have people want to wish you well. And you, you've got to have people, uh, you know, really like you and, you, you know, want to help you and be part of whatever it is you're trying to do. But you you know, you have to really know what you're talking about, too. They're not going to do it, you know, just because, it, you know, you're a nice Southern woman. And so I think that um, the whole, you know, a lot of companies today, they've got really great intentions about, you know, wanting to move the needle here around diversity and all these things that we're talking about. But um, it, I think that, and they're looking for resources to help them so that I think that, you know, we're fortunate that over the years that we have been really very focused on the whole issue around diversity so that we've built credibility. And, but we've tried to do it in partnerships and working collaboratively and, you know, making it a win-win for everybody. And, and, but more importantly, you have to be successful. I mean, it's a great thing to, you know, have all these ideas and good purpose, but you also, you know, you gotta move the needle and you gotta make it happen. And I think we've been fortunate in building networks that have really helped us do that. A, a quick question, and I just want actual words. Since you are the one who is now hiring the next uh, Fortune 500 women CEOs, what are, and you know, I've had this goal, we need 50, and now we're going to make it, but, but 50 is only 10%, frankly. What are the actual skills? If you could... Just list off the actual skills that are going to make a woman a great CEO. We probably have a lot of women listening in and they're saying, I want to be CEO. You're the one who knows. You're probably, you may know more than anyone in the whole world, this one very question. Now, listen here, you, you're really making me nervous <laughs> here. I mean, I wish I did know, but all I can tell you is through my experience, you got to really be a good communicator. You've got to be smart. You've got to know what you're talking. You've got to be smart. You got to have the facts. You got to have the data, um, and you got to be able to inspire and get people excited and motivate. And you got to get keep your ego in place. And and but you but but and that's a tricky thing because any good leader's got healthy ego. They need to have. If you don't have it, forget it. But it's the balance between keeping that ego in check but providing leadership, taking calculated, well thought out risks, speaking up. It's like women used to wear suits and pinstripe suits and ties to meetings. And I would say to these, I'm, I've never owned a pants suit in my life. I said, what does it matter with you women? You know, you want to be recognized, wear your skirts. You want people, you know, you're, you're so lucky to be a woman and be proud of it. And so it's, you know, it's sort of that kind of thinking. I don't know if that answered your question, but. I'll just jump in here. You know, Judy, you know, I spoke in that, you know, women need to lean in and support other women too, right? And I think you and, and Edie have been extraordinary examples of that, right? So do you just want to speak to that real quick? Because I think the more that we can support one another, we're going to see that, you know, level of women penetrating more of these opportunities. Would you agree? Absolutely. You know, and I've heard people say that women aren't supporting women. Are you kidding me? I've never seen women be more supportive of each other ever, ever, ever. That's why I'm starting this fund. I mean, you know, I'm not leaving it to all my grandchildren. 
I've said, you got enough here to get by guys, you know, but I've been so lucky and blessed that this is what I want to do. And this is what I think is so important is to help other women. And I know so many women here in Philadelphia and in our company. I mean, we have 75% women, if you can believe it. We got all these millennials. These white guys are so nervous in our company. They said, Judy, what have you done to us? They're half kidding, but it's been a wonderful melding, but it's so exciting, you know, to see women really, you know, part of building this wonderful organization and helping each other. I, mean, I, I think that's one of the most exciting things, you know, that I've seen happen recently. Well, it's great that you're saying that. I, I'm really inspired and, and thank you for your being that role model for that too. Um, let's move on. Thank you, Judy. Let's move on to, to uh, Doug. Robert, do you want to kick off with the lead question with Doug? Sure. So, so Doug, uh, you did this, the incredible turnaround, as everyone knows, of Campbell Soup Company, where they were actually going to be taking the chicken out of the chicken noodle soup. You did it through employee engagement. And you always say that's at the heart of, of, um, of diversity. Talk about why that is and then why you, um, you, were the, you, um, you brought Denise in, Denise Morrison, to be the first CEO of Campbell in 130 years. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to say how cool it is to be sharing uh, this program with Judy. Judy uh, it was a few floors above me in the same office building in Philadelphia. And uh, she is, uh, she is uh, a, a leading light on this whole concept of advancing, creative, inclu creating inclusive workplaces. Uh, at, the, uh, at Campbell, Campbell was in a state of disarray, which is when they hire new CEOs. And uh, I had come out of Nabisco right on the heels of trying to rebuild Nabisco after barbarians at the gate. And so I thought I'd seen it all then, but then I came to Campbell and found it was in a serious state of disarray. And I can remember on my first day of work, I, we had an all employee meeting that was broadcast to our 38 countries uh, where we had operations. Uh, and one of the most important things I said was, we can't expect you to value our agenda as a company until we've tangibly demonstrated to you that we value your agenda as an individual. And I wasn't speaking to just men. I was speaking to everyone in our company uh, across those 38 countries and across every discipline. And my observation was that somehow people were getting in the way of the decisions that were being made to try and save the business. And they were being a casualty of this effort to revitalize the company when it was all about getting them engaged so that we could revitalize the company. You know, Jim Collins uh, in his Good to Great book, best-selling business book of all time. The first thing he says, it's, he says it's, it's first who, and then what? You gotta get the right people on the bus. They've gotta be in the right frame of mind. I strongly believe that. And I, so I told them, we can't start winning in the marketplace until we win in the workplace. We got into employee engagement as a way to measure that and track it. And what we discovered was we had created a great culture for white men to be engaged. But when we looked under the hood, we found out that we had really abysmal levels of engagement for all kinds of diverse populations, the largest of which was women. So uh, we hired Catalyst to come in from New York and do an assessment of our diversity and inclusion practices. They said, not only do you have the worst employee engagement in the Fortune 500, but qualitatively, you have the worst diversity and inclusion track record that we can find. And this is for products that are sold, 85% of them are bought by women. And so we embarked on this change process. We said we have to do better. And it took a long time. Uh, it took us a better part of a decade to get to a place where we were really hitting stride with it. But it required great tenacity, great intensity, great commitment to the concept of diversity. And I guess the last thing is, in order to pull everyone together, we had to create a galvanizing sense of purpose that connected all of us to a higher order sense of purpose for our company. And uh, all of that came together to create a 
really remarkable turnaround over a decade. I'm, I'm losing you, Robert. Wait, no, I, I was saying it's handed over to Becky. Okay. Sorry about that. As Thank I'm you. Being... And I had I have my mute button on, Robert. So there you go. You know, Doug, just listening to you and and you know of knowing you a little bit here and this experience is it's you know your passion about leadership and that, that what you just shared with us is what great leaders do, right? And and they're purposeful, but they they do take action and they they walk the talk. But you you have been a, a teacher uh, and a student uh, of leadership for many many years, and so. To tell us, particularly in the post-pandemic era, what do you see are some of the critical leadership attributes, no matter where you sit in an organization, right? For men and women, for all of us. Well, I, I've got one fundamental belief, but I do think there are a couple of attributes. I was thinking about it as Judy was talking uh, about what does it take to become an effective CEO? I, I break it up. I have four buckets. I talk about character, competence, chemistry, ability to collaborate, and performance. And when I think of uh, character, is are you someone who's demonstrated time and again that you're authentically showing up and doing what you say you're gonna do? Competence is not just about technical competence, it's about IQ, it's also about EQ, and, and what I call functional competence, like if you, going to, if you're in a technology driven business, you've got to be somewhat competent on technology, but you also have to, the EQ is essential and the ability to collaborate is essential. Uh, all the derailing studies we've all seen would tell you that the soft stuff is the hard stuff. Very rarely does someone screw up because they had the wrong return on investment analysis done. It's because they didn't manage a situation with the requisite care. And, uh, and so that's where I think uh, women today can just shine and are shining across across the landscape in, in boardrooms, in CEO suites, and in C-suites. I'm very optimistic that we're going to blow past 50 and get to uh, well in, in triple digits before you know it. Now, I will say there's one principle I have, and that is to be effective in today's environment, you have to be tough-minded on standards of performance and tender-hearted with people. It's not one or the other, it's both. When I started, we had old white men working for older white men, and that was the name of the game, and you had to be tough, okay? Today, we have six different generations in the workplace a lovely array of diverse populations represented there. And not only do you have to adhere to high standards of performance, but you also have to adhere to high standards of conduct, conduct with people. It's not one or the other, it's both. And uh, I encourage all the people listening to this broadcast to take inventory and say, okay, how am I on my standards of performance? Am I holding people to high standards? And I, am I treating them with the requisite care? What we find is the people that are performing well in this pandemic are doing both. They still adhering to high standards. If you don't, as a leader, you probably don't have the job very long, but also you need to bring people with you. Leaders need followers and they need to know you care if you want them to care about your agenda. This is not rocket science, but it isn't easy. We've got to do both. We've got to be tough-minded and tenderhearted and take inventory of where you are on that if you're listening to this and think about yourself as a leader. How am I doing on my standards of performance and how am I doing on the tenderness with, with which I'm treating these people in these highly sensitive situations? All right, thank you for that, Doug. I think if nothing else, this pandemic has treated us, we gotta continue to accelerate and keep the high standards up, right? Get the results, but I think it's, the balancing and intentionality of, we've heard throughout these CEO roundtables, uh, the empathetic culture, right? Oh, the God. leader that does listen, right? Yeah. Uh, and even with the, the hybrid environment now, and even who knows what the workplace will look like in a year from now, but I think it's become even so much. And those are the hard skills that I think those, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, 
the one more question here that I think Robert, um, why don't you jump in and and and, and ask uh, one more question for Ralph? Uh, no, I'm actually or Doug. No, we are that? we are shifting now. It's back to you, Becky. You are going to introduce Walt. Okay. Well, Walt, welcome, and um, wonderful to have you here. You've got just an incredible background and has been a leader in the real estate industry uh, across the globe for, for years. Um, would love to ask you, um, when you were a CEO of a Fortune 500 company in real estate, um, you recently took on another a number of other board seats after that, um, which looking for those boards, they have your experience and, and your background. Critical question here, how have you assessed the boards that you're on? What are you noticing about some of the trends when it comes to uh, women and governance practices, uh, new approaches and priorities right now? Is there anything that's changed and um, hopefully for the better? Oh my, sure has. Um, first of all, Becky, I'd like to thank all of you from the WBC for having me on. It's really an honor to be here today, it really is. I remember my first board meeting at Prologis when I was the chief financial officer in the fall of 1999. The company had 10 or so board members. I don't remember exactly the number, but all were male. And most had been handpicked by the CEO or by the largest owner of the company at the time. And you know, while they had the best intentions as board members, they, they truly did, they were a pretty clubby group looking back on it. And um, they all agreed with most things. And I, I, I would say there was a lot of groupthink going on as I look back on it. And there was very little diversity of thought and opinions in the room. And few people at that point in time saw any connection between diversity and performance. That's just the way it was. And now, you know, fast forward to today, um, I, I see a lot more progress. Um, I sit on three boards with... Um, total market capitalization of close to $100 billion. So they're fairly large companies. 32% of my fellow board members on those companies are women. 37% of the senior management team combined in those companies are women. And one out of the three CEOs in those companies are women, or is a woman, I should say. And so, and I think the most important thing today is because people actually do see the benefit of management and governance diversity. Uh, I don't think they saw it. They weren't paying attention to it. Nobody was talking about it 20 years ago. Today it is. And I'm, look, I think there's a lot to do, no question about it. But I think today we're better aligned um, with our stakeholders, our customers and the like. And I, I think we're stronger companies as a result of it. So a lot has changed. Yeah, and certainly boards have a huge influence to drive accountability and to make those changes. Is there one thing you've observed that organizations, organizations uh, that you're serving on boards, that they're doing to make that difference now around really um, leveraging the, the greater gender equity within their companies? You know, I think they're, do they're doing a lot of different things. Um, I, I, I do think that, you know, it's not a numbers game anymore. It used to be, you know, well, the, the, here's, what are our hiring practices? What are our quotas? you know, manning, mandating numbers, that, that can be a zero sum game. And unfortunately, we need everybody to, to win today. And, and, you know, somebody mentioned before, um, I think companies need to be aligned with their, better aligned with their customers. I mean, women make 70 to 80% of all customer purchasing and uh, decisions through their buying power. And so we've got to have more women to, to align, but it's got to be a win-win I, I, in other words, I think the I think the men need to sign in, sign up to this too, and and um, and so I, I think it's it's culture. It's, I think it's creating different cultures in organizations where everybody thinks that they're winning. Um, you know, some of the organizations are creating programs to heighten awareness not only with women but but with men through education as to how it's benefiting their organizations, and some of them are beefing up benefits and you know, um, enhancing their career, career um, um, or, excuse me, enhancing social networks and, and actually aligning males, um, you know, making sure that, um, that they're male allies but, um, behind many of the social networks that are being created. So a lot of people are doing a lot of different things. Um, I think everybody's trying to figure it out today, um, truthfully. And I think people are, are very focused on changing their cultures 
Um, but at the end of the day, the anecdotal um, evidence is showing that things are getting better. Um, things are getting much more diverse. And I think we're, we're beginning as companies to think out of the box in ways that we never thought about in years past. It's almost like things have been disrupted and we're kind of creating that new normal as we go. Um, I think so. Uh, you know, I want to leave time here. I know that you um, have recently published a book. Congratulations. And I wanted to have everyone learn more about that. So, Robert, would you like to jump in and, and talk about, um, you know, Walter's new book? Yeah, yes, but here I'll, you can give one sentence on the, the new book is um, it's called um, Transfluence. It's really cool. It's about leadership and and how the whole new framework works in a society of diversity. So here's what I would suggest. Instead, everyone go to Amazon and just buy the book and read it yourself. But here's what we want to do. We want to now have Becky lead us. We spoke before. We talked about originally legacy. So that, that was past. We talked about present. Now we want to talk about future. So we are going to have a little bit of a panel where Becky is going to ask the panel more about what what the actions, what the actual call to actions you're going to do and people need to do in future. So that's why you probably all realize we've cut some of your questions short because we wanted to have this panel time. So all yours, Becky. All right. Well, we have a lot of, you know, followers of WBC, but I think one of the important things they want to come and hear from you, but they, they're looking for actions, they're looking for solutions, right, which you all have shared so many of. But if there is just one or two things, given that Robert said we've talked about the past, current, now looking into the future, uh, and we talked about just with Walt and I, things have disrupted. So we're, there's a new normal out there. We're more innovative in terms of our approaches. The governance is shifting rapidly, and we're seeing some, some positive impact with that. But if there's just one thing, um, or if it, it can be two, um, that executives, CEOs can take um, and or in, organ in their organizations. And if there's just one thing individually that I'm on a call today, what can I do personally to really move from that conversation to action today on this whole topic around purpose, driving a purposeful organization, people and business. Um, and as we talked about the whole gender equity and diversity. So if you're looking out into the future, what is one thing or two things that's gonna really take us there and make it a reality? Would you like one of us to start? Is that an oh, open question? Why don't question? you jump in? Yeah, I, any, there's no order here, so okay. jump in. Uh, let me just say from my perspective, I think the most important ingredients to success in terms of workforce diversity is having a CEO and a management team that's committed to it. I, I, and I'm, I'm gonna speak from a board member's perspective because I'm not a CEO anymore. Um, but you know, I think tone at the top is critical. Um, and, and, and it's not what, just what management says, it's what they do that counts. And so, you know, do they walk the walk? Somebody said that before. And, and do they hold themselves accountable? And I think the board has a real role in assessing that. Speaking uh, strictly from a board perspective, those people that are on the call that are board members, um, yeah, I, I think the board has a role in assessing that. And I think the board needs to be asking the right questions of the CEO, of the management team to make sure that they're demonstrating action, that they are walking the walk. You know, Does management come to every board meeting prepared um, to talk about it? Do they talk about it at, at every meeting? Is it being measured and how? And by the way, when you have your board dinners the night before, is everybody else in the company that you're having dinner with talking about it? And, and if they are, then as a board, I think you're, you're, you know, you're beginning to ask the right question and, and is management being honest about where they are? I think those are things that, that a board can do. I truly believe that tone at the top is really, really important. And I think that's our job to drive that um, or to make sure it's being driven within the organization. That's my call to action. Thank you for that. Do you Jimmy, know I'm going to call on you next. Who, were you calling on me? Because I was about to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> you go right ahead, jump in. You know, I think that it's a whole new world now. It's a whole new environment just on so many different fronts. And 
um, I think, you know, it's actions speak louder than words. And, it, you know, it's like, hey, you know, you got to get compensation right. And I still think that that, you know, is a very important part of culture and that there's so many inequities that have been allowed to go on for so long. And I think that that really sends a message to you know, the organization and it, and it also you know, validate your culture and that, you know, CEOs and senior management really, really need to, to take a look at compensation and benefits and, you know, things that are going to affect the quality of life, because that's what it's all about nowadays with people. People don't have to relocate. They're not going to relocate. And guess what? I mean, the pendulum has swung back in favor of employees. You know, labor unions are gaining power. I mean, they have been quiet and dormant for years. But to me, that underlies this whole thing about, you know, employees and people, they're going to have a say. And you got to have actions, you know, where you where the words are. And no more phony baloney. And, you know, it's got to be the real deal. As our yep. great president says. Yeah. We can have it on the website, but is it really, really happening? Right? So, absolutely. Rebecca? Thank you, Judy. Rebecca, this is Doug. Uh, I, I'm a big believer in action my whole career, but the, the, word, the words have to come first. You have to declare yourself as committed. As a board, we should demand uh, that our leader, our CEOs, uh, create this higher calling for the enterprise to uh, help build a better world. And we ought to and we ought to hold them accountable for declaring that and then bringing it to life. Actions independent of the words uh, are, are, are gonna, are hard to track and hard to manage. So I expect every CEO I work with to be prepared to lean into this notion, to declare what they wanna do, and then to go do it and be held accountable for it, not just by the board, but publicly and by the employee base. So uh, I don't want to say that words don't matter. Words and actions matter. Declare yourself and then do what you say you're going to do. Uh, because one without the other is insufficient from my perspective. So I, I sort of demand that leaders today stand up and be counted and make public commitment to, uh, to, to, to stepping forward with this and then be prepared to be held accountable for it. So uh, words do matter, actions matter too. Great. Yeah, Thank I'm you, let me add, uh, but yeah, let me add some thoughts to what uh, Doug and, and Walter said. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, let me, I'll give you two, uh, two things that I think are very important, whether you're a board member or a leader today. Number one, I think you need to make sure you're learning at the speed of change. There's so much going on with artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, new norms, that if you don't really understand it, you don't have to be an expert on it, but you have to understand the impact that those things will have on your business. That's number one. But number two, to comment what Walter said, I think it's not just the tone at the top today. You need to check the tone at the front line. Because in my experience as a CEO, sometimes you communicate and the tone is great at the top, but you better check the front lines because oftentimes there are filters in between. And I've been surprised at times and I've had to make corrections to the communications like Judy was talking about to make sure that the frontline peoples uh, were hearing what I wanted them to, to hear and not what was filtered and, and given to them by middle management. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Maybe the executive team is on board, but it doesn't cascade down, right? So really putting things in place to, to, to ensure that, yeah. Well, great. This is a great wrap up. I want to thank you all. Robert and I want to thank you for your rich stories, your examples. And I think modeling and inspiring all of us to lean in, right, to do our part as we really look at purposeful organizations, because there is a direct path and channel to purposeful organizations and looking at achieving equitable workplaces for all, including gender equity. So thank you for your leadership. We wish you the bell and the best in this path ahead and much continued success. So now I'm going to turn it over to Jose Zalestra, who will be doing our wrap up and capturing all the words of wisdom that we shared here today for everyone. 
Jose? Thank you so much um, to Robert and Becky for facilitating this amazing group of panelists. And, um, you know, one thing is very clear from today's session, and that is these CEOs are far from retired. Um, these successful former CEOs whose leadership talents uh, were made evident not only on the balance sheet, but also in really how they serve their people. And this has not stopped since they left their posts. Uh, they not only managed transition to a new CEO well, including the first woman to lead Campbell Soup, but they also honed their leadership skills during some very turbulent times uh, with a strong purpose and willingness to help the next generation of leaders, whether that's at the board level or through community of leaders or through entrepreneurs. And we learned a little bit about Ralph's uh, early days when uh, during his time in Ecuador and having seen the importance of having a diverse team in reflecting uh, their target audience and obviously resulting in greater innovation and uh, subsequent sales. Um, I love the advice about unlearn what you learned, which is no longer true. Um, during his experience with Apple. And when it comes to Judy, uh, her roots started in diversity and seeing an opportunity for women who wanted to work outside of the home and making it possible for them to have fulfilling careers long before this became mainstream. And through this has built one of the largest founded search firms in the world and making sure that purpose is ingrained in everything they do. We learned uh, for those uh, future female CEOs, uh, some of the skills that are gonna be important. Uh, that being, uh, being a good communicator, being smart, uh, making sure you know the facts and data, being able to inspire others, uh, take calculated risks, speak up, keep your ego in check. And of course, we all want women to support each other. And Doug left a legacy at Campbell's, not only by developing and promoting its first CEO, but also being very intentional about employee engagement and creating diversity, uh, not just of the white males that were engaged, but across all different uh, groups. And we learned about the four attributes of character, competence, ke uh, chemistry, and performance. Uh, of current and future leaders and CEOs. I also liked him saying that soft stuff is the hard stuff and leaders need to be tough-minded on standards of performance, yet tender-hearted on people. And lastly, Walt, um, really his experience of seeing the difference between being on a, on a board of only white men and resulting in groupthink versus being on boards that are much more diverse and much more diverse in, in perspectives as well. And, um, and how that's really created a better board and better outcomes. Um, and Walt's suggestion about creating a culture in an organization where everybody is winning, which is great advice. In terms of the actions, um, Walt, um, the CEO management team needs to be committed to diversity. They need to walk the walk and need to be held accountable. The tone is set at the top and the board has a role in asking tough questions. And for Judy, the action is to get compensation right because this is all part of the culture. For Doug, it is declaring and demanding that CEOs step up and create a better world and for the board to keep them accountable. Words and actions matter, not just words. And for Ralph, uh, the, the tone needs to be set at the top, but also at the front line, not just um, you know, at the leadership level and need to make sure that you're hearing what you want them to hear here and, um, and be careful of the filters uh, that come through middle management. So overall, a great conversation of both personal stories and proven leadership practices. Thank you for being so open and sharing these with us today. And to thank you all as we look at Judy and Walt and Ralph and Doug 
if you've set the tone for leadership and legacy. And we want to acknowledge your messages. And we also want to call on action as we're seeing not only the Fortune 500,000, but the number of private companies soaring in companies of purpose and also all the B corporations we see. So as these focus on leaders of legacy, the role of the boards of directors that all four of you emphasize, the role of the CEO, the role in the C-suite of driving change now. You are great change leaders, you are humble leaders, and we will work with you and drive this legacy of leadership now. WBC thanks you all. And to Robert and to Becky and Jose, thank you for your leadership because we learn every day and we make that commitment to action and we prove it with your power. Thank you.